Hello and welcome to the seventh episode of History of Armenia. Last episode, the Soviet had just conquered the short-lived First Republic of Armenia, and in its place had established the Soviet Socialist Republic of Armenia. But this was promised to be much bigger than it became, and included Nakashivan, Nagorno Karabakh, and Armenian Salian. But these regions were instead given to Azerbaijan. But after a failed coup attempt by the Dashnaks, the dominant party of the First Republic, plotters fled to the Armenian salient and after a few months of fighting got the area to be included into the Armenian SSR rather than the Azerbaijani one. This revolt was mostly done because of the Soviet's form to nationalize everything from companies to food and furniture by confiscating it from the local population. Seeing the ineffectiveness of these policies and the inexperienced local authorities the government of Armenia was switched for more moderate. The implementation of new economic policy in the Soviet Union allowed small companies in the country which helped Armenia along with getting food and better education things were somewhat looking up for Armenia at least compared to how they had it before but for the Armenian shirts things did not look great as communism is against religion but everything became much worse when Stalin came to power the new economic policy was removed and the forced industrialization happening all across the country also affected Armenia. Everything from farms to the industry became owned by the states which led to the quick modernization of the union although to the detriment of the starving citizens who work way too long days under terrible conditions. The situation for the Armenian church got even worse, especially during the Great Purge. The Great Purge was a series of execution and political repression against anyone not fully with the government. In Armenia, most victims were killed for the alleged allegiance to Trotskyism or the Dashnaks. Many of those executed were members of the Armenian Communist Party or intellectuals who could face a threat, but mostly just ordinary workers and peasants. There was also deportations of mainly Muslim Armenians from Georgia and Armenia to Central Asia. But soon the Second World War started and Armenia joined being part of the Soviet Union. Although no fighting occurred in Armenia, estimates of 400,000 Armenians fought in the war, over half of whom never returned. The country was put to work, providing food and material for the front. After the victory in the war, many Armenians put forth the idea of invading Turkey to retake traditional Armenian lands. The Soviets even started putting troops on the border, but because of Turkey's improving relations with the West and the fear of war and nuclear weapon, these plans were scrapped. After the last loss of life in Armenia after the World War, the Soviets allowed immigration to Armenia from other countries, even offering to pay for the trip and special benefits such as food coupons were offered for these people. But when they entered the country, almost all of the carried belongings were confiscated. Many natives also despised these newcomers, treating them poorly, recognized by the different dialects. But after Stalin's death, many of his reforms were reverted and religion and nationalism was not as strictly prohibited. This made Armenia's situation improve, but it wouldn't last long as this new leader was overthrown, leading to a period of stagnation within Armenia, as many of the new reforms were reversed. But during the mid-80s, this also changed with a new Soviet leader who opened up the Soviet economy more and made the government more transparent. But these more open policies also gave the people more freedom of speech, so the large Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh expressed their concerns regarding the region being part of the Azerbaijani SSR. This soon led to the parliament of Nagorno-Karabakh working in favor of a transfer from the Azerbaijani SSR to the Armenian one. The Armenians complained that no media or even schools used the Armenian language and the Azerification of the region that had made it so that now the Armenians only consisted of about a third of the population where they previously had held a clear majority. Large protests started in Yerevan for the unification with Artakh while they made a counter demonstration in Baku. But the leader of the Soviet Union came out saying that the borders would not change but soon the protests took a turn for the worse when an Azerbaijani protest was held in Artasakh, when police was called in because of the increasing destructiveness of this protest, a few Azerbaijanis were killed. Things became even worse in the city of Sumkayit, where mobs of Azeris attacked and killed the local Armenians, resulting in 32 dead, 26 of whom were Armenians. The Soviets tried to make a compromise, giving Artasakh more autonomy and introducing Armenian media and textbooks. This was not enough anymore for the Armenians. 
but soon they had a larger concern as a major earthquake hit northern Armenia, killing between 25,000 and 50,000 people, mainly hurting the cities of Pitak, Varnadzor and Gyumri. Following the earthquake, huge amount of humanitarian aid was required and thus the Soviets for the first time since the Cold War asked the US for help. They and over a hundred other countries helped. Following the chaos of the earthquake, the Soviets arrested many many prominent Artsakh politicians. Nagorno Karabakh soon became the prominent subject again, and the two countries tried to force the other nationality out of the country, leading to large-scale deportations of Armenian and Azerbaijanis. During these deportations, over 200 Azeris were estimated to have been killed by Armenians, while a similar number of Armenians were killed by mobs in Azerbaijan. These deportation and migration the once very mixed ethnic and religious layout of South Caucasus to very homogeneous areas. Later, the Soviet central government also took control of Nagorno-Karabakh to try to calm the situation. But tensions were still growing as Armenia embargoed Nakashivan Autonomous Republic and Azerbaijani nationalists sabotaged Armenian railways that were giving them 80% of their imports. As another large mob started killing Armenians in Baku, the Soviets had sent in military forces to take control of the city, leading to 120 dead Azeris. Small raids soon started to occur on the borders between the nations, which Armenians even conducted bombing raids, but these were stopped by the Soviets. Russia had also just been taken over by a non-communist government, so the Soviets now held a vote if the federation was to be dissolved, and all republics voted for but Armenians and some other republic boycotted the election, but later held elections of their own, declaring their independence. But while in the process of becoming independent, both nations started to gather up weapons for the supposed future conflict. To try to stop the Armenians from doing this, the Azerbaijanis asked the Soviets for help, which they got, but instead of disarming the Armenians, they deported many from the northern Karabakh region to try to hinder a full-scale war from breaking out. Russia and Kazakhstan tried to make the two countries come to an agreement and they almost did, but in the middle of the negotiation, a helicopter carrying Azeris, Russians and Kazakhstani politicians was shot down, ending the peace talks. This happened just after the official Armenian declaration of independence. And soon after, the Azerbaijanis declared their independence as well. The Soviet Union was soon also formally dissolved. And with that, I will end this episode with Armenians and Azerbaijanis on the verge of war, just after the independence.